Hi guys and welcome to a new video on Sonal's life. Now I'm sorry if I look very tired. I'm currently on about three and a half hours sleep because last night we had the hotly anticipated second event of the Forbidden Door and that was AEW and New Japan coming together and basically giving us matches we never expected. Now there are so many matches so I'm just gonna get on with it. We're gonna go through all of the bouts and the results what my thoughts were on the matches so the best match the worst match who shine the most and also what's going to happen going forward because it was literally stacked from top to bottom but whether i would compare it to the last event and say it's as good you'll have to wait and see so we'll get started with the pre-show i didn't watch this live because i thought right let me just get at least an extra hour sleep so i watched it the next day so this morning it was fine, there was nothing really big. I was really surprised at how many big names were in the pre-show. So, I mean, especially as a New Japan fan. So, El Fantasmo, El Desperado, um, The Empire's TJP, Jeff Cobb and Kyle Fletcher, and LIJ's Bushi, Hiromu and Shingo. I mean, one of the highlights has to be the first match. So, it was um, some members, I think, of like, the AW roster versus... Desperado and Chaos's Rocky Romero, Chuck Taylor and Trent Barretta. The world's most bizarre combination because bearing in mind when um, best friends were in New Japan as Chaos, Despi was in Suzuki Goon, they would never have even thought about teaming together. The best moment was obviously they liked to hug and at one moment the three Chaos members just went and hugged Despi and he looked really confused. But like I said, it's worth a watch. There's some really good matches. Nice way to get the crowds excited. And you get to see some of the best New Japan fans. Some of the best New Japan talent. You'll probably notice I'll stumble some words. Like I said, very tired. Had to get up for work, but we are here. We then got started on the uh, main card. And I'm going to have to look because obviously it was a bit weird. Like, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was a very weird structure of it in terms of like where the matches were based so you know in new japan it's quite consistent where you start with the smaller matches you're normally young lions then multi-mag matches special singles matches and then the title matches that was completely thrown out the window and maybe one of the reasons that maybe one of the low lights of the show but yeah we'll start so the first one we had was for the AEW world title and it was their champion mjf versus hiroshi tanahashi you guys know how much I love Tanahashi. He is there on the wall. He is the ace of my heart. This match just wasn't it. We have been saying this for a while that Tanahashi is not in good shape. His knee is banged up. He is not moving as well as other people his age. I've pointed to people like Taguchi, Satoshi Kojima, who I'll mention later on, and Yoshinobu Kanemaru, all a similar age, if not the same age as Tanahashi, but still much better. Now, I'm not saying that this means that Tanahashi should not wrestle anymore. I'm saying that Tanahashi needs a break. And ahead of the G1, this was not what he needed. On a plus, MJF really played to this. They made it a match about storytelling. So it was funny. At one point, MJF had a tweet sent schedule saying, by this time, I'd have beaten Tanahashi. And he hadn't. He played on the crowd's booze. On the other hand, Tanahashi played to the crowd's cheers. He must have known he wasn't in the best state. His knees weren't great. So he, he channeled his inner baby face. Now, it wasn't surprising that MJF got the win in the end. There was a bit of cheating going on. But I, I, I do love Tanahashi. He's one of my favourite wrestlers in the world. But I just want him to be healthy. And I feel like this match didn't showcase him as it's his best. And had a few people going, is Tanahashi still right as the ace of the company? The answer is yes, he is. But this match didn't show it. Like I mentioned in the Tanahashi match, I mentioned Satoshi Kojima. So the next match was for the Owen Hart Cup and it was a semi-final between Kojima, so one of the New Japan dads, Red Club leader, versus CM Punk. Now going into this, it was all crowd basically about CM Punk. He's returned to AEW, he's got heat from the crowd and you're comparing that to the legend that is Kojima. Compared to Tanahashi, Kojima is in amazing shape. This match was great. It was a really nice mixture of amazing wrestling from both guys with their own style, but also storytelling. So there's some a funny video coming back around from the Ring of Honor days with Samoa Joe and Satoshi, I mean, and CM Punk talking about lariats, which is obviously Kojima's arsenal. We saw CM Punk doing Tenzan's Mongolian chops, um, moves that mean a lot to Kojima. But what I love is Kojima took that in his stride. He is 
unbelievable wrestler like even now decades into his career and this match was really nice it wasn't a title match there was really no implications and no need for Kojima to win which he didn't but it was great it was like two of the best names in the world well I wouldn't say I'm a complete punk fan like I never really watched him when he was in WWE because I wasn't into it at that point and I'm not really feeling him at the moment it was a really nice match and the fact that Satoshi Kojima got such a big match on such a big card I am all for bread club because you know what bread is life and yeah, it's again another distinct difference between Kojima at this age and Tanahashi and the state of their bodies. Controversially now, and this is going to be like people going to be like, how are you saying this? I'm going to talk about the next match, which is probably my favourite match of the night. And I know people are going to be like, Sonal, that is weird. It was for the, and I'm going to say it's the AEW International Championship and it was a fatal four-way. So we had the champion Orange Cassidy who... Albeit while I don't watch New Japan often, I mean AEW often, I've always loved Orange Cassidy. Some people hate him. I love his style, that he mixes this sort of dry, unbotheredness, but can suddenly flick a switch. New Japan legend Katsuyori Shibata. Again, we're in 2023 and Shibata is in the ring. We have, um, I think he's Ring of Honor, Daniel Garcia, who I didn't really, I wasn't aware of. And obviously, the man of everyone's hearts, the New Japan World Television Championship champion, Zack Sabre Jr., the four most random people in the world. This match lasted 11 minutes, but it packed the entire kitchen sink into it. So at the start, Orange Cassidy was doing his like pathetic kicks and it quickly went crazy. So Garcia was obviously the fall guy and he wasn't the one that people were looking at, but he really got into his role. So at one point, Shibata and Zack Sabre Jr., obviously sworn enemies, were beating each other up in the ring while Garcia was trying to get involved in it. They just kept whacking him away. We had submission strikes. At one point, Zack and Shibata had submissions on their opponents, but then they were hitting each other. Then Shibata and Zack got put into submissions, but were still hitting each other. It was extremely fast paced in a way that works for this sort of title and works in Fatal Four Ways. Something that isn't very often seen in New Japan, if ever, really. We see triple threats and things like that. And in the end, it's not surprising that Orange Cassidy got the win over Daniel Garcia. And what was funny was at the end, Zach was like, this isn't over, dickhead, and stuff like that. And I feel like with all of them, there is something to go on. We, of course, want to see Shibata versus Zack Sabre Jr. in more than just an exhibition match like we saw. Give us Orange Cassidy versus Zack. Shibata versus Orange Cassidy even though they have this like mutual respect it seems yeah people are gonna say I'm crazy but for me this was the match of the night it was funny dynamic fast and obviously it's got Zack Sabre Jr which is always great and then we went on to another match with one of my fave boys it was for the IWGP heavyweight title higher up in the card than the AEW one but I feel like it's in the middle so it sort of worked it was Sonata versus Jack Perry's so Jungle Boy. Now, people were confused when this match was set. Sonata set an open challenge. Jack Perry, he answered it. And everyone was like, why? No one knows who this guy is. But that has sort of been the legacy and what is going to happen with Sonata's reign. He's fighting the new guys. He will be doing that in the G1. And that worked perfectly. I think this was more storytelling. There were two amazing guys with amazing wrestling. Like, it was a clean match. They were showcasing their best. And what I love about Sonata is despite being obviously the senior and the champion, he was showcasing Jack Perry as an amazing wrestler. Um, he came out with, a, I don't know his name, but someone who must be like with his team or something. And it was nice to see different parts of both guys' offense because while Sonata is very strong and big, he's also very athletic, similar to Jungle Boy. Now, obviously, Sonata got the win now. They kind of made it a point that Sonata won with the Muta Moonsault. While this used to be his finisher, it isn't anymore. So it sort of shows, oh, well, Jungle Boy isn't up to any standard of Sonata that he could go with his old finisher and still get the win. The big moment was obviously after the match, Jack Perry turned heel. So he bounced on his partner. Really good going forward. It sets a storyline there. Sonata's got another successful defense ahead of the G1. And it leads into the fact that his G1 block is basically full of the babies. So it works perfectly in that way. We then had a Lord, the most chaotic, but really exciting 10 man, 10 man tag team match ever. And you'll hear why it was amazing and why it was so random. And again, 
one of the best matches i think of the card so on one team you have the blackpool combat club so it was john moxley claudio castanoli wheeler Yuta, and uh, my boy from ddt albeit he's a heel now konosuke takeshita teaming with shota umino so our young lion and then the world's most random thing so let's rewind back to 2018 2019 when i started watching new japan and the elite were very much there so we had the newly reformed elite so the young bucks and hangman page teaming with eddie kingston who we will be seeing in the g1 later in the month yeah later in the month and tomohiro ishii this they are giving us teams that i never thought would happen Back when the Elite were in New Japan, they were Bullet Club, enemies of chaos. So you'd never see them fighting on the same team. But this match worked perfectly. Like, I could say everything that happened, there was interactions between people I didn't expect. So um, I cannot remember, and people have confirmed that I don't think there was a time where Hangman Page was in the ring with Shota Umino when he was a young lion. Same with the Young Bucks. There was never a time, I think, really, that apart from the trios match that happened at the last show there was not no really time that we've had Ishii and Castanoli Ishii and Yuta the big one for me the Ishii and Takeshita like interaction in the ring as someone who has been watching DDT for about three years and has watched Takeshita knowing that he is one of the aces of DDT like multiple champion one of the stars I used to compare him to like Okada and to see him go in the ring against Ishii and teaming with Shota Umino, two of my New Japan favourites, it's like, it shows how amazing pro wrestling is. Because maybe two, three years ago, to have a ring with people from four or five different companies would never have happened. There were so many good interactions. We saw the, I guess, not the past, but like the veterans of wrestling. In Moxley, Castanoli, um, Ishii, the Young Bucks, Hangman Page. And we saw the future. So Wheeler Yuta, Umino, Takeshita, um, so I've got Eddie Kingston as well. And it was amazing. So many amazing dynamic moments of the teams working together. And please, I need Ishii versus Takeshita in the end. Um, I'm going to see yeah, Ishii pin Wheeler Yuta. Not surprising. The experience, the size difference, it just made sense. And you know what? I always say this. I used to love Hangman Page in New Japan. I always wish that he'd have stayed there and stayed away from the elite. But seeing this, I remember why he is so good, because cowboy shit is real. And we then had the sixth match, so it was the AEW Women's Championship, so Tony Storm versus Willow Nightingale. Willow Nightingale is the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Now, honestly, I feel this was too high in the card. It was unnecessarily, like, high. It was, it was a title match, I get it, but in terms of what they did with it, it was fine it was great willow nightingale is phenomenal in the ring she has such an exciting presence she is so bubbly and amazing wrestler similarly with tony storm i've watched her for years she has this new faction behind her and that was the storyline going into that you'll hear why this wasn't really great for me because when i talk about the osprey match there was interference that's how tony won i'm not a fan of it i love that they showcased the women on the card but obviously that's Tony's shtick that she has her faction mates behind her and they're going to help her win. But I really see a really bright future for Willow Nightingale. She is the pure baby face and I'd love to see her at some point in, in New Japan on like a show. Obviously we've got the women's title which is currently in stardom and I'd hope to see her at some point. Again, a, a great match, really nice showcase of women. I thought it was very high on the card but then again... I can't compare it to New Japan where there was always quite a strict pattern of the matches and how it goes. We then had the match, which people are going to hate me for this. People would have called it the match of the night. It was phenomenal. It was a match of the year contender. It was Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay for the IWGP United States Champion. So part two. Let me start by saying this match was phenomenal. It was great. Kenny and Osprey two of the best in the world. Osprey is one of my favourite wrestlers. Has been, was the reason I got into New Japan in the first place. This match, I don't know. There was something about it. They are phenomenal athletes. They gave me spots galore. Even the blood, I was like a bit cringing behind my pillow at like 4am. Like, it's not great. But there was so much passion in Osprey. Like, 
he knows this is his last chance he has said it if he doesn't achieve what he wants by next year is new japan is wrestling for him he is come back from injury he knows his body is not holding up so he wants to make an impact similarly kenny i think this is his second defense of the title since he got it in january he sort of gave his title as top gaijin to osprey when he left and he still wants to prove that yes osprey you have got better but i am still the top guy and they showed that there were some brutal moments. They were doing each other's moves. There was Os Cutters, One Winged Angel. There was one point where Osprey hit Kenny with a One Winged Angel. And then Kenny kicked out of one. They hit on the turnbuckle. They hit on the steel steps. My issue came with Don Callis. Now, Osprey is a heel, I guess. He built up his character as a heel of Heart Forbidden Door. He started in the Empire as a heel, whereas now the heel are tweeners. Now, we have said all of the heat empire are normally heels in the match they will never let any outside interference impact their matches they will have the members coming out in bouts but will never get involved this did not happen with don Callis. um he came out the start gave will a screwdriver was distracting kenny was presence there brought out bodyguards while i understand it plays to the storyline in AEW, so this ver this feud between don Callis and kenny omega and also playing on Osprey's heel status in Canada, it wasn't Will Osprey. Will Osprey has never cheated, even when he started in the Empire and they were true heels. He is known for his fighting spirit. And I would have loved to have seen, because he got the win in the end, and I was so happy that the title is coming back to Japan. We'll see it in the G1. I was so angry that it was overshadowed by this story of Don Callis, taking away almost, not entirely because Osprey still shine, but taking away from Osprey's moment, and I've mentioned this with some people on the internet who I'm in a like chat with, it almost westernized this match for like an IWGP match. Now, people are saying this was the best that they've had. I preferred the Tokyo Dome. I believe that that showcased more of who Osprey is. Yes, I know Osprey is aggressive and things like that, but the Don Callis storyline took over for me, and I. If they do it again at All Out, I don't want Don Callis there. I want to see the New Japan Will Ospreay, not this Will Ospreay that is wrestling in AEW. Again, I am being controversial AF during this video and people probably go, Sonal, you're mad. It was an amazing match. I am not taking away from Ospreay and Omega. It was a phenomenal match. If you take the wrestling alone, match of the night. But for me, wrestling is also about storylines. It's about fighting spirit. And for someone like Ospreay to have... Don Callis and that takeover, I was sad. Um, I mentioned at the start, this show was weird because of the order of the matches. We then had a six man tag match. Let me just double check who was in it. So it was Sammy Guevara, Chris Jericho and Minoru Suzuki. Yeah, bizarre. Facing Darby Allen, Sting and Tranquilo, Los Ingobernables de Japón's Tetsuya Naito. It was a fine match, like no implications really, some amazing spots like Sammy Guevara hitting Sting into a table and then Sting coming out. Um, Jericho and Guevara doing like the LIJ um, pose in the middle of the ring, Naito being Naito. I just felt like it was 15 minutes. It felt, to be fair, it felt a lot shorter. It felt like the wrong place in the card. You put it after an amazing match like Kenny and Osprey and it sort of brings down the vibe and I guess that links to the next match so I the main event dream match Okada versus Brian Danielson people had mixed feelings about this I loved the match it was much slower than the other bouts and maybe it worked to its detriment someone on Twitter said that the crowds were kind of tired by then I think it had been it would have been on five hours it would have been nearing midnight because it was 5 a.m here it was a phenomenal match. It was a dream bout. Brian Danielson versus Okada, the styles are so different. Brian Danielson is much smaller, a ground guy known for his strikes. Okada is big, strong, athletic. And it worked perfectly. They were having to bounce off each other. The slower pace worked for both men. But then there were flurries of offense. What I love is that everything that Brian Danielson had Okara has something to match it. He wasn't going to change his style. He was focusing on his big strength, his phenomenal drop kicks. And similarly, as someone who started watching 
Brian Danielson in WWE, seeing some of his signature offense. Now, there was one moment where Brian Danielson was, I guess, I thought it was real, but apparently not, pretending to have seizures. I know that he'd broken his arm during the match, but at one point, like, Brian Danielson was convulsing. And then it was seemingly used as, like, a ploy for Okada. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with using medical conditions, and I think he has a past history of it. Using that as spots in a wrestling match, when we know that is very, very dangerous and very common thing in wrestling to happen, that you get dropped on your head and that suddenly you lose your senses because of like a nerve getting damaged. That, I guess, put it sort of down a bit for me. Um, but the offense was great. The wrestling was amazing. Another issue, the ending. I was looking on Reddit and the, the ending was basically Brian Anderson submitting Okada. And it turns out Okada has not been submitted. I think it was 2015 and it was last done by Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, I don't know if there's a reason. Are they gonna use it to uh, motivate Okada ahead of the G1? Because remember, he has got quite a busy block. He's got quite an intense block and he'll wanna win because he's not got a title. However, it just felt like it wasn't right. Someone pointed out correctly that Brian Danielson has not been in big singles matches in a while. Okada has. Okada, despite not holding the title, has put on phenomenal matches time after time. To have him submit, be submitted in, I think, let me check the time. Like, you're going to see me keep looking down. In 27 minutes, an amazing 27 minutes, it just feels like it wasn't meant to happen. That was my full review. And I guess, while there were some amazing highlights... I didn't feel it the same as the last show. There was opportunities for some amazing matches that were then brought down by storytelling or spots that weren't there. I'm not also going to mention the fact that Jay White wasn't there. I know that despite me thinking, oh, it should be classed as an AEW show, so Jay should be there. People have corrected me, so I'm not going to use that as like a downside because I do miss Jay in New Japan. But there were some amazing matches. But there was also some that I just went, ah... And some that I thought we needed to swap it around. Like, for example, Sonata versus Jungle Boy, amazing. Should have been given some more time to really shine. Osprey versus Omega didn't need Don Callis. It just took away from the amazing wrestling. Similarly with Daniel versus Okada, didn't need the convulsing part of it. And yeah, I feel like even Tanahashi and MJF could have been higher up. <coughs> Because despite Tanahashi not being at his best, he put on a story for people. So let's go with, I guess, top matches, least favourite matches and MVPs. So top match, again, controversial. It was the Fatal 4-Way. I found it amazing. It was fast, dynamic, everything I wanted. Least favourite, I guess I'm going to have to say the six-man match. For the place that it was, it didn't give me what I needed. Yes, I got to see Naito. I got to see Suzuki. It just didn't do it for me. Uh, the MVP of the show? Oh, that is hard. I think we're still going to go with Will Ospreay. Because despite the Don Callis stuff, he is a phenomenal wrestler. Proved why he is so amazing in the ring. And one of the best in the world. It wasn't just his wrestling. It was his mannerisms, his aggression. It all links into this whole storyline going forward of Ospreay needing to have this win over Kenny. Needing to have this momentum. And it leads nicely into what we've got in the future. So we've got the Independence Day shows coming up in July. And then later in the month, the G1. Then obviously at the end of August, we have the big All Out show at Wembley. And the Repro show. It's a great time to be a wrestling fan. While this wasn't my favourite show of the year. And many New Japan shows have surpassed it. It was great. It was amazing to see so many different wrestlers interacting with each other. Like I said, I got a dream match seeing New Japan guys with Takeshita. But maybe it just felt a little bit flat for me. Like, hell, I enjoyed some of the opening matches better. I guess call that as me as a New Japan fan. So with my controversial video and controversial thoughts over with, let me know what you think. Let me know in the comments on social media at wrestling underscore chat. What were your thoughts of the show? what matches exceeded your expectations which didn't live up to it and which was your favorite so whether it's a favorite match or your favorite wrestler let me know in the comments i've got loads of content coming up today so i mean by the time this is out i'd have already done 
a video with True Heel Heat and you can expect an Ace Techers podcast coming up soon. So to keep up to date, you can follow me on social media at wrestling underscore chat, hit the like button, share it with your friends and hit subscribe because like I said, the next video will probably be a G1 preview and it's gonna be a busy few months. So hopefully you enjoyed the show, you enjoyed my video and I will see you guys very soon. Bye.